Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. What a great conference that we have going on here. The speakers this morning, all the presentations. I've really been enjoying myself. I hope you guys have as well. I'll be talking about the cis-lunar economy. And what I'm talking about is really the space economy and where that is going and how we at United Launch Alliance are trying to grow the overall capabilities and activities in space. To begin with, let me give you a little bit of background who we are at United Launch Alliance. We were formed about 10 years ago. We're a coming together of Boeing's Delta program, Lockheed Martin's um, Atlas program, and we build and launch the Atlas and Delta rockets today. Um, the Atlas rocket is a modular rocket, can have anywhere from zero to five solids on it to get more um, performance, can have different size fairings to suit different customers' needs. Similarly, the Delta can have two or four solids, or it can have three of the cores strapped together to give it more boost. And these are what are launching the majority of the nation's national security, science payloads, as well as um, commercial. Start with, let's go with a little launch movie. Always fun to watch rocket launches. Lift off on the shoulders of Atlas. The SS Geek Slate 2 Orbital ATK Cygnus spacecraft soars toward the International Space Station. And we have liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket carrying the 11th GPS 2F satellite from the United States Air Force. And we have liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket carrying the NRO L 55 mission to the National Reconnaissance Office. And liftoff, liftoff of the 100th United Launch Alliance rocket. Ignition, two, one, zero, and liftoff of the United Launch Alliance, Delta IV rocket carrying the seventh WGS satellite. We have ignition, and we have liftoff, liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket carrying the tenth GPS 2F satellite for the United States Air Force. And liftoff, liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket for the United States Air Force. We have liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV rocket carrying the 9th GPS 2F satellite to the United States Air Force. And liftoff of the Atlas V with MMS. And liftoff of the Delta II rocket with SNAP, making global observations of soil moisture and climate forecast. We have RD-180 ignition and we have liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket during the third mobile user objective system mission for the United States Navy. So we're launching national security payloads, the GPS satellites that are on orbit, we launch those. When you use your phone to get places, we help get those to space. The civil space, we heard Chris this morning talking about Juno. We supported that launch. Um, Alan Stern talking about Pluto New Horizons. That was launched just before ULA um, formed on an Atlas V with five solids on it. And then Worldview and other Earth imaging satellites, commercial communication satellites, we've been launching those. Most recently, we've launched two in the last six months for orbitals, um, flying Cygnus payloads for cargo resupply at the space station. Going forward, we'll continue to support orbital. We'll also support Sierra Nevada with the Dream Chaser launches. And then for crew, starting next year, we'll be flying CST-100 for Boeing. Uh, test demo next year followed by a, a actually crewed mission. Looking very forward um, to that. In total since ULA formed late 2006, we've actually had 106. One more since I put the slides together. A week and a half ago we launched Cygnus. ULA's vision going forward is how do we help um, execute mankind's potential in space? What we're trying to do is enable all of the missions that we are supporting today, the national security, science, and so forth, 
But what we're really trying to do is go beyond that and grow the benefits of space for the rest of us here on Earth. We're trying to do the transportation that will allow all the companies that are dreaming of how to do new things in space go execute that and really unleash the potential and grow the overall space economy. What I'm going to be talking about today is a vision of how the space economy can grow. We put this out um, on Twitter probably six months ago, Cis Lunar 1000 Vision. What that is is a vision of where we could be in the next 30 years in terms of what we're doing in space. Today, the activities in space include all of the national security, we're exploring the planets, we've got the space station on orbit, five or six people living um, day in, day out on the space station. The total space economy is worth about $330 billion today. A lot of that is in the form of the content that's being beamed down, television, GPS, as well as the actual satellites that are being manufactured and so forth. Looking forward, just five years from now, we could have commercial space stations on orbit in addition to um, the ISS. Bigelow, for example, yesterday his, a demonstration mission was launched up to the space station by our um, competitor, SpaceX. That's going to be docked to the space station, a small version of what he's trying to do in terms of a large commercial habitat. A lot of people are, have been studying on the space station. How do we do manufacturing? How do we do new kinds of things that we can't do here on Earth that the zero G of space really enables? As these commercial space stations are orbited, the ability to go manufacture those in commercial quantities is going to start to take place. In addition, ULA, we're going to be replacing our Atlas and Delta with Vulcan and a new upper stage, ASIS, and those will be flying within the next five years. We envision on the order of 20 people being on orbit and the economy growing from 330 to about $500 billion in space. As time goes forward, this is going to accelerate. We're going to take those capabilities and you're going to see real products being manufactured in space. Fiber optics that instead of needing repeaters every 10 miles under the ocean, every 50 to 100 miles. Drastic benefits for communication. There are methods for um, building chips on orbit that can reduce the flaws, increase capability. Beyond that, we will see people prospecting and extracting lunar resources. To begin with, we envision water out of the poles, transforming that into propellant that we can use to fuel the transport transportation infrastructure. Beyond that, 30 years hence, we see a much larger space economy, a much more dynamic space economy that's using things from Earth as well as um, material mined from the moon and the near-Earth objects to allow full-scale manufacturing in space. Cislunar 1000, the 1000 stands for 1,000 people working and operating in space for the betterment of humanity. It's not that far off. It's something that can happen, and all of the underlying technologies have been developed over the um, last decades and they're really on the verge for being able to come out and help the economy. What ULA is doing is we're trying to open up the transportation system everywhere between here, the moon, near-Earth objects, to enable companies that want to do this mining, the manufacturing, to be able to do those and bring their products home to, to help everyone. Today, the activities that are done in space include the space station, remote sensing, communications, national security type things. Right on the verge, as I mentioned, commercial habitats. That's going to be happening very quickly. But there are a lot of things beyond that that people have been dreaming about since I was a kid. I got enthused in space back in the 70s. Gerald O'Neill and others were talking about solar power satellites and colonies in space. That's why I got into the business. That's what's really keeping me going, is helping make those things happen. 
So as I said, the prospecting, the mining, manufacturing, solar power satellites, those are all things that we can see in our lifetimes really come to fruition. What we're doing to enable this is we're taking our legacy upper stages. They're all LOX hydrogen based. They're fueled with LOX and hydrogen, the highest chemical energy that one has for um, uh, propelling upper stages and the whole transportation architecture to support this future vision. One of the things that has been learned just in the last handful of years is water is everywhere. It's trickling out of the side of uh, hillsides on Mars. It's on a lot of the asteroids. It's on the moon. So we can access the water, crack it into the hydrogen oxygen, liquefy it, and all of a sudden, with a hydrogen oxygen based propulsion system, we can fuel it from Earth, we can fuel it from the moon or the asteroids or Mars, and we can open up the frontier. What ULA is uh, developing is ACES, derivative of Centaur in our Delta cryogenic upper stage. And with a mission kit, we can have ACES not only travel in space like our current upper stages do, but actually deliver payloads directly to the lunar surface. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But one of the key enabling things here is once you've climbed out of the immense gravity well that Earth has, reuse these things. Don't bring them back to Earth. Reuse these on orbit, refuel them on orbit, and keep going. So lunar water. There's a lot of debate on how much lunar water there really is, but there is estimates as large as 10 billion tons on each of the two poles down in the permanently shadowed regions of some of the craters, like Shackleton and such. One of the things that the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter has discovered, and that was another mission that we launched for NASA a few years back, is that there are places on the poles where you've got these permanently shadowed craters, and the rims surrounding them are in nearly permanent sunlight. So you've not only got water potentially there, but you've got energy in the form of near continuous sunlight handy on those crater rims. We see people taking that forward to work the mining and the extraction of the water. Shackleton Crater is a perfect example. This is another picture from the LRO mission, um, colorfully imaged on the left and in natural black and white on the right. But landing hardware deep inside this crater that will actually extract that water, landing hardware up on the rims where you'll have your energy stations that can transmit power down into those shadowed regions and extract the water and silica and other minerals to support activities both on the lunar surface and in space. And I'll go on about some of that. The first step to figure out where this material is most easily extracted and what form it is in Right now, people don't really know what form it's in. Is it 10% water in these regions, 50% water? Does it go down a meter or two? Does, is it a consolidated ice block? Or is it more like a frosty? Can you dig it? Or do you have to sublimate the water out? Those are all questions that are out there. One of the ways we know that there actually is water beyond neutron spectroscopy that's been up in orbit is the LCROSS mission, that flew as a dual mission with LRO. We dropped LRO off on a translunar trajectory. We did some minor course changes with Centaur, and then we safe Centaur. We completely blew all the hydrogen oxygen propellants out, the hydrazine, and the LCROSS payload took over and shepherded the combined LCROSS Centaur for the next several months as it looped around the moon and then did a descending crash into the crater. First time I've ever been happy to see one of our vehicles crash. It was outstanding. And what that did was it blew a plume out of the crater and LRO was flying over. There was a lot of um, people looking from Earth. A lot of you may have been looking at the time to see what was coming out in that plume. And they discovered Lo and behold, there was quite a bit of water along with other things. 
So we know there's water there. The form is what's in question. So NASA is um, planning. They're working on the um, lunar um, prospector. I think that's currently aimed for about a 2021 launch. And that will do exactly what I'm talking about, trying to figure out what are the exact contents in different places on the moon. And then there's commercial companies, Moon Express, Astrobotics, Mastin, that are looking at building small commercial landers. Um, this Griffin lander from Astrobotics may fly before the end of the decade and give us really good local in situ data. What are the properties? What does it take to mine this, the moon? Getting back to what is ULA doing? We've been flying since the late 19, or early 2000s, the Atlas V and Delta IV. Before that, various families of Atlas and Delta that go back to the 60s, very much improved. We're going to start transitioning from these legacy products to our new Vulcan. That'll happen first flight end of the decade. We will transition over the next several years, retiring Delta and Atlas, going purely to Vulcan. Shortly after Vulcan starts flying, our new upper stage, ASIS is going to start flying, and it will provide a lot more capability to the Vulcan ASIS um, launch system. We're going to add capability to that as we go. The ability to recover and reuse our booster engines, the ability to refuel the ASIS stage on orbit, and the mission kit that turns ASIS into a Zeus, a lunar lander, to support those kinds of missions. What we're doing is opening up the whole cislunar system to support activities, um, commercial, science, um, and so forth. Vulcan, my team led that development, the trades of the propulsion. That's one of the things that is amazing today is how robust and vibrant the space industry is. Never before have we had the choices that we have today. When we were trying to figure out what Vulcan should be, we're flying um, RD-180s under Atlas, some minor issues with the Russian content there. We've got the RS-68 under the Delta. We're trying to find a, a system that's as robust as those, but at a much lower cost with pure American content. And we had a lot of options. BE-4 is being developed by Blue Origin. That's a pre-burner hot fire test from a little over a year ago there. And we're able to take advantage of what is already being developed to fuel and power our future vehicles. When ULA was formed, we brought Atlas and Delta together. Very different systems in some ways, very similar in other ways. We're taking the best from each of those as well as new innovations to go into the vehicle structure for the um, entire vehicle. We will continue to have a modular system. So we'll have zero to six solids that will be able to power the system. And then Centaur will be pulled over initially from Atlas. It will be replaced a couple of years later with our new upper stage. ASIS is where the magic really begins. ASIS is a stage derived from both Centaur and the Delta cryogenic second stage. It's a LOX hydrogen powered system. It's about three times the size of today's Centaur, the same length, just a larger diameter. So it's got a fairly squat, convenient form factor in terms of inter um, interacting with the booster vehicle. So both the booster and ASIS are gonna be 5.4 meters in diameter, very clean, um, Line there, very easy to manufacture and stack on the, on the pad. I mentioned in the booster propulsion arena, we had options. We had even more options on the, the upper stage, and we've never had that before. We've flown RL-10s ever since the beginning of Centaur and, and the Delta Cryogenic stage. The rl 10s an outstanding engine. It's been upgraded over the years. Aerojet is looking at upgrading it further to the RL-10CX. They're in the middle of that development, and it's going very well. We've been working for several years with a small company, x on a piston-based LOX hydrogen engine. End of last year, they had the first closed-cycle hot-fire test of their 10% scale engine, and they've commenced um, 
development of the full-scale 25,000-pound thrust engine. Blue Origin is flying the BE-3 on their new Shepard. It's the one that they've flown three times and recovered. They're developing an in-space version of that, the BE-3U. ULA intends early 2018 to down-select between those three propulsion options and complete development qualification of one of those to support the ACES mission. We are also developing brand new, very modular avionics to support um, the ACES stage. We need avionics that can support missions anywhere from half an hour, ISS delivery type missions, eight hours for GSO, a week for lunar orbit missions, accommodate refueling, accommodate actual um, rendezvous, as well as landing on the moon. So it's a avionics well beyond the capability of historic avionics systems. The cryogenic storage, we boil off quite a bit of hydrogen, in particular today, a little bit of oxygen. And with ACES, we are changing the design from our current vehicles to enhance the cryogenic storage to support at least the several weeks of storage for a lunar type mission, but with full-blown refueling, the capability to support years of continuous reuse. The real magic with ACES comes in the form of integrated vehicle fluids. What that is doing is it's replacing the hydrazine, the helium, and the batteries on today's systems. We use hydrazine to maneuver the vehicle, to settle the propellants aft, to roll the vehicle for maneuvers that need to be done. But we only have a certain amount of hydrazine on the vehicle. Once that's gone, the capability is over. Helium is another thing. We pressurize the tanks both for strength, but mainly to prevent cavit cavitation of the engines. When you run out of helium, you're done. You can't keep going. What IVF does is it says, no, I don't want these other commodities. I'm going to take the hydrogen and oxygen in the stage. As long as I've got hydrogen and oxygen, I can generate power. What we're going to do is we're going to take the boil off hydrogen and oxygen, which today is just thrown overboard as waste. We're going to burn it in a six cylinder internal combustion engine. We're working with Roush Industries, the ones that do Mustangs and racing engines and such. They've built us a prototype shown here. They're just moving forward on the flight engines at this point. And that's going to be the, the energy producer, like in a hybrid car. It's going to run a generator. That's what it's going to do. Beyond that, that electricity is going to be used to power the vehicle. It's going to be used to power a compressor. And we're going to recirculate the hydrogen and oxygen gas. That's how we're going to pressurize the tanks. No need for helium anymore. And we're going to use that hydrogen and oxygen in small nine pound thrusters to do the reaction control. The reaction control engines are the most mature. We're going to start flying those the end of next year and support Centaur missions before it gets implemented on ACES in the future. What this capability does is we're no longer limited to an eight hour mission like we are today. We're no longer limited to the three burns like we are today. What we'll be able to do is go for the weeks. As long as we've got hydrogen and oxygen, We've got the power to go do these missions. When we run out of hydrogen and oxygen, we refuel with more hydrogen and oxygen, regardless of where we're getting that. That can come from Earth. That can come from the moon, asteroids. Doesn't really matter. It can be launched by us. It can be launched by someone else. We're looking for the cheapest um, fuel to refuel our system, regardless of where we are in space. We don't have to refuel helium or these other systems. We just need the hydrogen and oxygen. So it enables on-orbit reuse. Distributed launch is another technique. It's the beginnings of reuse on orbit. Today, we launch a rocket. It's got all the fuel in it. It's got the payload on it. It goes and does its mission, and it's done. What we're talking about doing here is we're going to split the launch into two or more launches to support a given mission. The first launch will just launch a tank of propellant to orbit. That's all it does. Vulcan ACES is capable of 38 tons of launch to low Earth orbit. Over 35 tons of that is transferable propellant. 
Once it gets to orbit, we're going to go into a transverse spin. We're just going to go end over end, and we're going to let it sit there for weeks on end. On the order of three weeks later, that's about our mean time capability between launches today, we'll launch the actual mission with the payload. That mission will get to low Earth orbit. Unless it's a super heavy payload, it'll have some propellant left in the ACES. It will rendezvous with the propellant tank that's been waiting for weeks on orbit. When they get close, we'll stop that spinning. They will fly in formation. We will couple hydrogen and oxygen transfer lines and refuel the ACES that was on the second launch. Once we've transferred all the propellant or filled up ACES, those two will separate. The tanker um, ACES will deorbit to dispose of it in a safe manner. Then the ACES with the payload will go on and do its mission, whether it's a GSO payload or a lunar type payload. One of the benefits of doing this, first of all, you, get, you can launch a lot more payload to um, beyond LEO orbits. But even more is you get more than twice the capability, um, two launches, roughly twice the cost. But we actually get substantially more on the order of three times the payload to the lunar surface, for example. So using distributed launch reduces the cost to transport payloads to these various destinations. It also is the beginning, it's the early form of refueling. We can demonstrate it here. Then when propellant is available from other sources, we will already have this in hand and it will benefit those missions. Zeus, one of the reasons that I became really excited about space, this was even before high school, back in the early Apollo days, the first Apollo landing, I was watching that, I was all of three years old with my mom, and she was trying to explain to me how these were the first people to ever set foot on the moon. I asked her in my young wisdom if she had ever been to the moon. She tried to explain, well, these are the first. No, I haven't been there. So I promised her at that point that I would someday take her to the moon, doing my best to keep my promise. Zeus is an ACES vehicle. The ACES is very capable already, but it can't touch down on a, a surface. So in order to go to the moon, the basic ACES can do all the orbital maneuvering. It can do the arresting of the um, velocity down to just above the lunar surface. And it could let a payload go there. But the payload would have to drop to the surface. What we're doing with Zeus is we're taking that basic capability. And we're adding a kit to enable actual landing on the surface of the moon. IVF generates about 30 kilowatts of power. We will use that power to drive electrical hydrogen and oxygen pumps. And so once the basic ACES and the main propulsion put us at essentially a hover, a little bit above the lunar surface, we'll turn off that main propulsion. These electrical pumps will pump hydrogen and oxygen out of the main tanks, feed it to small thrusters that are on the side of, of ACES, and those small thrusters are what are going to gently bring the stage down, land the stage on its side on the lunar surface. Some people have asked, why are you doing something so stupid? You've got these big engines on there. Just use them. Land on the tail like what you've seen Falcon do. What's happening, though, is as you've got these big engines, they're boring a hole into the lunar surface. They're creating a dust cloud just as you're trying to see where you're landing. And then once you do set down, your payload's way up on top. How do you get it off? With Zeus, these small thrusters are designed exclu exclusively for the final landing on the moon. And so they aren't high powered. They're about 1,000 pounds of thrust each. And as you're coming down, they gimbal outboard. So you aren't directly impinging the ground below you. Once you're down on the surface, whether it's cargo as in the upper picture or a crew module in the lower picture, that cargo is right there on the lunar surface, ready to get to work to support whatever that particular mission is. So a typical lunar mission would pull all of these capabilities together. We would launch the propellant. A few weeks later, we would launch 
the second vehicle with the lunar bound payload, the ASUS kit that, or the Zeus kit that adds on to ASUS, we would rendezvous in low earth orbit, transfer propellant, do a second burn and now we're on a translunar um, trajectory, we coast for three or four days to the moon. Do another burn to get into lunar orbit and we coast around doing the phasing to get to where we really want to set the payload down. We'll do another small burn using the RCS system on ASUS. It will bring um, perigee down to just skimming the lunar surface. Coast halfway around the moon, do another main propulsive burn. We're now at essentially zero velocity on the order of a kilometer up. Turn off that propulsion, turn on those electric pumps, and we set the payload right down on the lunar surface. Supporting science missions, propellant extraction, prospecting, um, and human transfer um, missions to support either um, local uh, manufacturing type activities or um, scouting or other things that people will be doing there. We see in the future, 30 years out, I mentioned the manufacturing and extraction, not only of propellant, but other things. We see a future that has something potentially akin to this, manufacturing facilities on the moon. This is um, from Offworld Consortium, a subsidiary or a subset of Shackleton Energy. And on that surface, you've got the water extraction. You've got all the energy intensive needs to crack that water into the hydrogen and oxygen, liquefy it. You've got mineral resource extraction. What do you do with all that material when you're done extracting it? What do you do? Zeus is specifically designed to be able to return to orbit, refuel the stage, takes about 70 tons worth of propellant, and the stage can take Coincidentally, another 70 tons of payload, whether that's propellant or our other material, to L1. Deliver it there, reserving enough propellant to return to the lunar surface to do that over and over again. So once you've done one mission, you've got the equipment there to keep reusing to do follow-on missions to support the whole cis-lunar economy. So someone like Offworld that wants to extract water they need the transportation to get there. We would like to provide that transportation. They need a customer for their products. We would like to be able to buy propellant from them to support our cislunar activities. So there's a real benefit to both helping each other and doing what we're respectively good at. At this point, nobody really knows how much it's going to cost to extract resources from the moon. There's a lot of ideas on how to do it, but there's so many unknowns, I wouldn't call any of it reliable. What I tried to do here was say, what would it take price-wise, purchasing hydrogen and oxygen on the moon, to have it the same price in LEO as launching that propellant from Earth? Because if they can do it cheaper on the moon, then it's definitely cheaper for me to operate our cis lunar all the way down to low Earth orbit from lunar-derived propellant. If they can't, well, that propellant may still be cost-effective in other locations. On Earth, the hydrogen and oxygen that we use to fuel Centaur is about a dollar per kilo, combined hydrogen and oxygen costs. Once you get that to orbit, though, the launch cost adds another four or so thousand dollars. So it's $4,000 per kilo in um, LEO. As you go climbing up Earth's gravity well, go from low Earth orbit to a geosynchronous transfer orbit, it about doubles in price. By the time you get up to geosynchronous orbit, it's about $16,000 per kilogram coming from Earth. On the other hand, on the moon, the delta Vs, the gravity well of the moon is so much smaller than Earth that it's much easier to get there. The transportation costs are much cheaper. That's one of the reasons why Zeus can do single stage from the moon to L1, where doing single stage from Earth to orbit is extremely difficult. It's just the depth of that gravity well. What we're finding is that if you can 
extract water, convert it to, into propellant, hydrogen oxygen propellant, for about $500 per kilo, that's cost comparable in low Earth orbit. But it's tremendously cheaper than trying to bring propellant out of Earth's gravity well. So we use this as just a, a, a what if as we start talking with companies that are trying to do the extraction. If you can do it for this, we can be a customer of yours in the future. Another thing that people have talked about, certainly since I was young, is solar power beaming. It's one of those things where the cost of launch and the current estimates for a multi-gigawatt solar power satellite, per John Mankins, others have similar, about 12,000 tons. To put that in perspective, a Delta Heavy can launch about 28 tons at a time. That's a lot of launches. So with Vulcan, Vulcan Centaur, to launch those 12,000 tons from Earth would cost about $320 billion. Quite expensive. ASIS really ups the launch mass capability of Vulcan without increasing the cost. And so the cost comes down substantially. But still, who in their right mind would spend the better part of $200 billion on a solar power satellite? There are a lot of entities out there that are trying to reduce the weight of how do you generate solar power, how do you convert that into microwaves or other means to beam it to Earth. If that mass can be brought down, obviously the costs come down. On the other hand, if you can extract water cost effectively from the moon, you can also get substantial cost reductions by fueling the whole on-orbit transportation from lunar sources instead of bringing everything up from Earth. But if you can launch it directly from the moon, the price just plummets tremendously. And the assumption here is that Zeus is doing round trips about the same cost as our mission integration today. And propellant, I'm trying to remember, I think we assumed about 100 times more than it costs here on Earth to, to give their real incentive to do that, at the same time reduce the total costs. If one can combine all of those, on-orbit manufacturing, lunar near-Earth object resource extraction, advanced methods for converting energy from solar arrays into microwaves, the cost competitiveness for solar power satellites can get to the point where at least it's competitive with niche markets here on Earth. There are places, islands, Afghanistan, so forth, that energy is extremely expensive. In the long term, we see a path to lunar-based um, power actually being cost competitive and potentially cheaper than generating that energy here on Earth. We're trying to lay the foundation to help prove that that can happen. If that were to get to a cost competitiveness with Earth, the, the whole Earth's energy economy is $6 trillion today and growing quickly. That's a huge opportunity for a space economy that currently is worth $300 billion. I mean, a factor of 20 increase. Um, that would really get to the point where the space economy is self-sustaining and people that want to emigrate to, the, to Mars, Moon, um, colonies in space, there's, a con there's an economic reason for those people at that point to be able to do that. As we talk with companies that are trying to do things in space, many of them are small companies that aren't well resourced. Others are large companies, but their resources are focused on near term things. Every one of these companies is telling us they need to demonstrate cost effectively the technology to do whatever they want to do. They need to cost effectively do the prospecting or the manufacturing. One of the things that ULA is doing to try to jumpstart these new activities in space is provide rideshare capabilities cost effectively um, to companies doing this, companies, universities, research organizations. We've launched four times the NPS Cool, which is on the left there. It's a 
deployment mechanism that can release tw up to 24 small nanosatellites. CubeSats, the basic cube is a 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter little tiny satellite. Though each of those units can be put together in a modular form and that you can have a 2 or a 3U satellite built out of those. We can launch 24U at a time and that's what we've been doing, supporting primarily national um, government type missions. Late last year we announced that we're going to start doing this on the majority of our missions going forward. We've done it on a few. We're going to start flying on almost every one of our missions 24 units worth of CubeSats. Three of those we're donating to universities. And if you go to the United Launch Alliance's website, if you're a university, you can apply for a free ride. The other 21 on each of these flights, we're working with Tyvac to integrate companies that want to do whatever their business is, whether it's taking images of Earth, demonstrating um, deployable solar arrays, um, technology for beaming, going to an asteroid and touching and sniffing what is there. Um, so those, um, if, if people are interested, contact Tyvac. You can contact ULA and we can get you in touch. And starting next year, we're going to be flying these regularly. Those small things work great for some demonstrations, but not everything. In addition to that, we are looking at flying larger, though still manageable size spacecraft that we would integrate on the aft bulkhead of Centaur up to about 100 kilograms. ABC stands for aft bulkhead carrier. We used to have a helium bottle there, didn't need that helium bottle. We've got room now to put these small payloads. In a 100 kilogram um, form factor, one can do a lot. Serious prospecting missions can be done in that form factor. Beyond that, something up in the class of 1,000 kilos. This is integrated directly into Centaur's payload adapter. The bottom of that picture is the front end of Centaur. The primary payload would go on top, showing C adapters. Those are just 60-inch diameter rings and an ESPO ring, which can handle up to six payloads. That's what's shown there. L-Cross was an example of this when it went to do the, the crashing into the moon. There are companies, I mentioned a few, Astrobotics, Moon Express, Mastin, others that could benefit from this kind of a capability to launch lunar prospecting missions, to launch other technology demonstrations. In 1,000 kilos, you can do a lot. So we're trying to enable much more affordable access to space not only for the primary missions, but also for all of those that are trying to do the research to enable new capabilities. This is from our last launch with CubeSats. Um, that's a CubeSat being forced out from this NPS cool on the back end. There goes another, another, and within the 24U capability, there's four individual 6U slots. And those can come out as single payloads or as six individual payloads. And what you saw was the release of those from a camera on the back end of Centaur. So where we see space going is a much broader use than communications, um, GPS, Earth imaging. There's a lot of things that people have been doing over the years that are just on the cusp. We see a lot of government activities, but we see a lot of commercial activities. Will the vision I laid out here happen in 30 years? Will it be longer? Will it be faster? A lot of stuff is, um, appears to be lining up to show that we can do this very rapidly. The American space economy has never been as robust as it appears to be right now. From the stuff that NASA is doing with SLS, Bigelow is doing, a lot of these other companies in the launch field. We've got a lot of competition, a lot of people trying new things. ULA is developing our own new rockets to address the competition. Certainly an exciting time to be part of the space industry. We see a very growing economy, 
and I think it'll benefit America in the long run. Thank you. telescope has revolutionized the human experience countless times since its creation some 400 years ago. Celestron is doing our part to continue the evolution of the telescope and expand the horizons of the human mind. For decades, Celestron has been committed to providing individuals with high-quality telescopes and optical instruments at affordable prices. We strive to clear the way for intellectually curious people around the globe to experience and explore deeper into nature and the cosmos. When I think of Celestron, I automatically think of the people. Um, to me, a company is people. We have people that are passionate about what they do, and we have extremely talented individuals that work for this company. And I think it takes those, um, those intangibles to create great product. Founded in 1960 in Los Angeles, California, Celestron has been an industry leader in telescopes for over 50 years. As the world's largest telescope brand, we continue to develop technological innovations that set the pace of the industry. Celestron is synonymous with inspired design and state-of-the-art technologies. As an industry leader, we strive to remain the world's most innovative telescope brand. As a rapidly growing outdoors company, Celestron focuses on products that enhance the exploration of the great outdoors. As a champion of STEM education and the arts, we pursue the advancement of public scientific understanding. Our long-standing track record supporting astronomy, education, and outdoor-related nonprofits across the globe speaks to the values we hold dear. Celestron is committed to encouraging the exploration of our natural world in fun and unique ways. There's like a lifetime of good memories at Celestron. It's probably one of our star parties. I'd say probably at the Badlands when we had in the middle of nowhere a crowd of hundreds of kids coming off of school buses, coming up and observing the sun for the very first time through a telescope. I've had so many amazing experiences here at Celestron, from helping assist with the setup of equipment with Stephen Hawking, to the very humbling experience of a standing ovation after we announced to teachers at the National Science Teacher Convention that we were donating the binoculars to them. One that definitely stands out as a uh as kind of an achievement in my career was when we launched the SIVO telescopes, the Celestron Evolution. That was a really proud moment for me to be able to look at the people that I've essentially had grown up with and spent my career and be sort of at the pinnacle of achievement and be able to sort of unveil that and communicate that to, to all these people that I've, I highly respect and have worked with a, a long time. One of the things that makes a company great is great employees. We just strive to push the envelope to really accommodate the needs of our customers. Those are the keys to what drives Celestron and what makes us successful. Our goal is to inspire a sense of wonder, curiosity, and fun in our communities and throughout our company. 
we desire to be a vehicle that helps drive humanity's insatiable desire to know the universe. My vision for Celestron would be taking all those qualities that the company's built upon and taking them into the future, into the next generation. And so we need to be continually evolving as a company. As someone that's been in this industry a long time, I do think that Celestron's best days are now and the even better days lie right ahead of us. We dedicate our work to opening the eyes of the people around the world and enhancing their view of the cosmos into the past and on to the future.